From 1837 to 1857, Robert and Anna Burwell operated a school for young white women in Hillsborough, North Carolina. During this time, their family would grow from two children to 12 children. What were Robert and Anna Burwell like as parents? What was it like for their children to grow up Burwell? Robert and Anna's family was considered large even by antebellum standards. Anna had a child approximately every two years from the age of 22 until the age of 42, four girls and eight boys. Children in large families grow used to sharing their parents. However, the Burwell siblings had to share them not just with each other, but with all the young women who came to be educated by their parents. Students boarded with the family as well. In 1850, the 10 eldest Burwell children were all listed as living at home, as well as eight student boarders. Beyond school responsibilities, their parents were constantly being pulled into the work of being a minister and a minister's wife. Robert traveled frequently, and Anna was expected to complete regular visitations to his parishioners, leading her to declare in 1846, I can't bear to leave my children and almost resolve I'll never do it again. But Anna would of course have to leave her children quite regularly, be it to visit in the community or teach in the school. At a time when few women had a profession beyond the cares of their home, Anna had the equivalent of a full-time job, along with the pressures of a large family. As a mother, she was constantly worried about how to manage it all, especially caring for the moral and spiritual character of her children. After a day of teaching other people's daughters and managing her own household, she was faced with the task of teaching her own boys and spending time reading with them. While Anna was more hands-on with the children, Robert still seemed to find time to develop relationships with them and do things to make them happy. Anna did not always approve of his methods, at one point lamenting in her journal, Mr. B bought a carriage for the children, high priced, and that worried me because I try so hard to save in every way, and this is so unnecessary. But he did it to gratify the children, his greatest pleasure. The Burwells believed in the importance of education and made sure that their sons were college educated and their daughters had the skills they would need to teach. The emphasis on education was such that Anna once remarked that she supposed they were always having financial difficulties because they were educating such a large family. The Burwell parents had established quite a system to help them in their desire to educate all their children. The girls were sent north to Anna's brother and sister-in-law in New York to complete additional studies in music. The point of this was twofold. Most practically, the Burwells relied upon the girls to work unpaid as teachers in the school, thus reducing costs and allowing them to have the funds to send the boys away to school and on to college. The girls also served as walking advertisements for the caliber of education students would receive at the Burwell School, enticing families to send their daughters to be equally well educated. From a philosophical perspective, this education fulfilled a deeply held belief by Anna that educating women was a necessary step to ensuring they were able to be self-reliant. Should the need arise, her daughters would be able to support themselves by giving music lessons or teaching school. In 1856, Anna complained to her daughter Fanny about a local woman whose family was struggling with poverty. Billy Scott could go off and teach school and be independent, but oh me, that would be coming down. I hope all my children will be too proud to let others do for them what they can help themselves. It was expected that the Burwell sons would go off and be educated, going away to school between the ages of 14 and 16, and then attending college. This was a common practice of the day, but the boys were not always happy about this decision, and their reasons to resist going away to school ranged from homesickness to a desire to be independent. Son Armistead particularly wanted to start working at age 18, so he no longer had to rely on his brother John and his father financially, but he was overruled. Anna shared her opinion on this with Fanny when she wrote, I told him it was his duty to do as we desired, and by getting a good finished education, he would sooner be able to help us. 
He seems now to have a perfect horror of teaching, but I'm in hopes that feeling will wear off when he goes to college. Armistead apparently got over his horror of teaching and did so for several years before eventually becoming a lawyer and judge. Of the boys, only eldest son John chose education as his lifelong career, eventually working with his parents at both the Charlotte School and Peace Institute in Raleigh. While it was expected that the boys would all be trained to teach, Anna wrote in her journal in the 1850s that she would be thrilled if God would call all her sons to the ministry. Only one of her eight boys would follow that path, her youngest son, Richard, who was ordained in 1878, seven years after her death. The other Burwell sons all went into business and their success was no doubt influenced by the importance their parents placed on their education. The Burwells would have been unable to find any sort of success as educators without the work of the enslaved people who toiled not just in Hillsboro, but also at the school in Charlotte. The Burwell children grew up in a household that relied on slave labor to function, and son John would establish his own household with enslaved individuals gifted to him by his wife's father. Little is known of the relationships between the Burwell children and the enslaved members of the household. However, we do know that Marianne, who was with the Burwells from at least 1846 until her death in 1868, may have felt fondly about the Burwell children. In 1855, when Fanny was in New York, Marianne took over preparing a package for her. Anna wrote to Fanny, Now you must appreciate this kindness in Marianne, for I had nothing to do with it. It is all her own kind affectionate feelings to you. The Burwells experienced the first death in the family when 17-year-old Fanny developed an infection while studying in New York and died in April 1856. Within a year of her death, they made the decision to move their family from Hillsborough to Charlotte to open a new school. Anna had always felt displeased with Hillsboro, and they felt that Charlotte would offer more opportunities for their boys. After a few years in Charlotte, the family would have settled into a new version of normal, only to be faced with the loss of another child when eldest daughter Mary died unexpectedly at the age of 27. Within two years, the entire family would face additional turmoil as the country entered the Civil War. For four years, battles raged, young men left home to fight, and families struggled to survive. The six eldest Burwell sons all served for the Confederacy. The Burwells depended on the unpaid work of their slaves, so it is reasonable to suppose the boys fought, in part, to preserve the family livelihood and way of life. Years after the war, the surviving Burwell sons often attended Confederate reunions, and son Armistead, who had become quite prominent in the state, spoke in 1910 at the unveiling of a Confederate monument and delivered a speech extolling white supremacy. On the home front, while the school continued to operate, the undercurrent of life was the war and its impact. For the Burwell children, especially the younger ones, it was a time of unease. Are you afraid of the Yankees? 13-year-old Jenny wrote to her 15-year-old brother Eddie as Sherman's army advanced on North Carolina. I was very much frightened at first. I thought sure they were coming, but they have gone another route. In 1864, the Burwells lost the first of their children to the war, when son Jamie was killed October 19th in the Battle of Cedar Creek in Virginia. Son Robert had been wounded in battle in June 1864 and returned home to recover. Though cared for diligently by his mother and siblings, he died of complications in March 1865, less than a month before the war ended. The Burwells entered the Reconstruction era with their school still intact, and in 1866, daughter Nanny married and moved to Raleigh with her husband, William Crow. Nanny would be the only daughter to live past her 20s. Anna and Robert were once again faced with the premature death of a child when 16-year-old Jenny Burwell died after a short illness in October 1867. Jenny's death seemed to hit Anna particularly hard, and a year later, she was still writing in her journal about how much she missed her child. It is thought that Anna never recovered from the death of Jenny, 
By this point, she had lost three of her girls and two of her boys. At the time of her death in 1871, her youngest child was already in college, and her other children were well-established and thriving. Robert Burwell would live until 1895, assisting his son John in yet another female school endeavor at Peace Institute in Raleigh. Both Robert and Anna would be described in glowing terms by their son John, indicating that he held a great deal of respect for his parents and the lives they lived. Growing up Burwell meant many things. The Burwell children came of age in a household that valued education at a time when many, especially women, had little access to instruction. They grew up in a household accustomed to enslaved labor, and they imbibed notions of white racial superiority. The children were under the scrutiny of their community because of the public nature of their parents' professions. To be a Burwell child came with a commitment to support the livelihood of the family and assist the siblings that came after. As parents, Robert and Anna had high expectations for their children, but they also sacrificed to provide them with an education and the ability to lead independent lives. The Burwell children would go on to become active members of their society, and their varied careers would not have been possible without the time and energy invested in them by their parents. You can learn more about the Burwell family on your next visit to the Burwell School Historic Site. We look forward to welcoming you to Hillsboro soon.